We've all heard the term nitrogen fixers. We know that certain plants add nitrogen back into the soil, leaving it more fertile than it was before they were planted. But do you know how it works and why it's better than just adding nitrogen manually? Because if it were that simple or effective in the long term to get nitrogen into your soil, well, everybody would just be adding it synthetically. So before we get into your options and why they're better, let's get the science talk out of the way and explain just how nitrogen fixers get all that nitrogen in the first place. You see, plants for the most part get their nitrogen from the soil. They suck it up through their roots after the bacteria and bugs and grubs have broken down whatever fertilizer you've put in for them to work on, leaching the nitrogen out of the ground as they grow, leaving less of it by the time they're done with their growth cycle. But our fixers aren't reliant on the nitrogen in the soil. They can get it from the air. And what they don't use, they dump that out through their roots, leaving more behind than there was when they got there. So why can't other plants do this? Well, to put it simply, nitrogen comes in many forms depending on how it's broken down. And, and most plant sorts need it to be broken down in its final time within the ground and with the help of lots of bacteria before they can use it. But nitrogen fixers aren't finicky about how they get their nitrogen fix. Up in the air, there is more than enough of it to go around. The atmosphere is made up of nearly 80% nitrogen, so they get so much of it in that a lot of it gets dumped back down in the ground. And by the time it exits their system through their roots, it's been broken down enough that other plant sorts can use it. Nitrogen is pivotal to plant growth. It's the building block of amino acids and plant protein. That's why nitrogen fixtures grow so fast. Your legumes always outstrip the rest of the vegetables when it comes to how fast they're putting on growth. But while the legumes are made to handle all of that nitrogen, the other plants can't. If they grow too fast, they lose a lot of their nutrition and health in the process because all of their energy is now focused on growing, not leaving much for anything else. So when we chuck all of that synthetic nitrogen into the ground, they're sure doing a lot of growing, but they're more susceptible to disease and they don't quite have the time to give their fruits all they need to be nutritious. They spread it out over time, a slow release, if you will. Or they get so much nitrogen from the supplemented fertilizer that they don't put on fruits at all. Instead, vegetables and grains grow huge, green, and have an excess amount of foliage, but the flowers just didn't have the time to turn into fruits at all because they were pushed too fast and too hard. And if you can have too much nitrogen, then you can certainly have too little too. Those plants will have stunted growth, yellowing leaves, and no or very little fruits to show for their struggle. Now, you can plant the fixers, harvest them, and follow them up with a new crop that'll then reap the rewards that the fixers left behind. Or, even better, you can intercrop your produce with fixers, allowing for a slow and continuous release of nutrients throughout the growing season. But there's something else that nitrogen does besides encouraging growth of plants. It also encourages growth of bacteria, and you really want those workers in the ground. When we mentioned earlier that nitrogen comes in many forms, and not all of those forms are absorbable by botanical life, it's left to the bacteria to break it down so that the other life forms can use it. Essentially, the nitrogen in the air gets absorbed by the soil, and inside the soil, the bacteria consumes the nitrogen and adds oxygen to it, thus creating a new form of partially broken down nitrogen that plants' roots can now absorb. Nitrogen fixers themselves are natural landlords to these kinds of bacteria. That's why they can take it directly from the atmosphere. And by the time they're done with it, it's digestible to everything else. And now, the most important part of this video, some examples of nitrogen fixers. Let's start with the permanent options first, and then move on to the seasonal options that can be planted in between rows of other produce. And the great thing about fixers is that you don't have to till the plant material into the soil to get more out of it. A lot of people do till it in when the harvest is over with, and it certainly adds more nitrogen to the soil, but you really don't have to. The root system pumps so much nitrogen in already that adding even more by tilling the rest in is overkill, and you risk overfeeding your crops, leading to lesser yields. It doesn't get more perfect than this. It leaves more food in the soil than there was before it got there, and it discourages tilling. Now that's a win-win in our book. Acacia, alder, black locust, and wisteria put a great deal of nitrogen back into the soil, and they can act as a shade and windbreak for your fields and the garden. Acacias are a very good example of the kind of tree that you want around when creating a microclimate with as much diversity in natural organic material to keep amending the soil. 
Acacias grow lots of flowers that bring in the bees, and when the flowers are done for that cycle, they're thrown down to decompose among your crops. And yes, nitrogen fixtures, drop leaves, fruits, and flowers are all very rich in nitrogen, giving you even more bang for your buck. Plenty of berry varieties will give you all the nitrogen, while they provide edible berries and that extra green matter at the end of every season when they throw down their leaves. Cherry silverberries, seas buckthorn, buffalo berries, and American silverberries are all good options. All clovers, though most are low-growing, there are some shrub varieties, are fixers and provide valuable fodder to your animals and have a long history of giving humans medicinal aid too. Pigeon peas are edible for animals and humans, and so is sweet fern. You've probably noticed that we're focusing on plants that are edible and can serve multiple purposes. There are plenty of non-edible, even decorative shrubs and trees on the table, but for our friends interested in rotational grazing, with the intent of planting cash crops in the field after the animals have left, clover, berries, and legumes are going to give you the most bang for your buck, so we're putting them up there just because they're so versatile. Herbs are obviously edible and we use the word weeds only for convenience. What we mean is focusing on the weeds that grow naturally in your area and that can double as fodder for your livestock. Wild bean, prairie turnip, licorice, and milk vetch are all fantastic options. Actually, all the variations of vetch are fabulous fixers. False indigo, butterfly peas, and sweet peas will round off our flower species for those who like a bit of vibrance in their gardens while refeeding their vegetables too. Now we get to the most versatile of them all, the vegetables and cover crops, especially for grazing purposes. All of the legumes are well known and usually mentioned first when nitrogen fixtures are brought up. The beans in all of the variations, soy, pinto, green, and fava. The peas, black-eyed, garbanzo, sweet, and cow peas. You can plant legumes for days and your hungry soil and animals can never get enough of the legumes. Additionally, fenugreek, sesbania, and trefoil are good options. And for the biggest money crops, besides soy, alfalfa, peanuts, and hemp will always have someone scrambling to buy up your harvest at the end of the season. If you're still worried about your land not getting enough of that nitro, add some chicken manure to the mix. Although any fowl species manure will do. Pig and rabbit droppings are higher in nitrogen too, but nothing beats chicken compost. With most other crops, you need to be careful about how much foul manure you add, since it's quite acidic and can burn foliage and roots as it breaks down. Or it needs to be composted completely before adding it to the rows. But nitrogen fixtures aren't too finicky about getting it without it being completely broken down. Rotate your chickens onto areas that might need more nitrogen. Make sure to allow enough time for the manure to break down before planting. If your chickens get a layer of straw for scratching, even better. Plop the manure, straw, and all down. The grass will act as mulch, and the droppings will decompose over time, giving you a consistent release of nutrients for months. Some people even prep their greenhouses this way while overwintering their chickens in the greenhouse. Your coop gets a cleaning, and the plants get a feeding, and everyone's happy. Once all is said and done, it doesn't really matter what kind of planting you're doing. Fodder, rotational grazing for later cash plantings, a permanent field or eco-forestry, any and all agricultural land can do with a little nitrogen helper. And if it can be intercropped with other crops, all the better. The more variation you get on your land, the better everything else will produce. Do you think it stops at nitrogen? Heck no. Every single living and growing orgas... Do you think it stops at nitrogen? Heck no. Every single living and growing organism puts a little something back into the soil to make up for what it took from it. Get your fields green, lush, and ripe by adding more and more so that you can get more. Or what do you say? Has consciously adding nitrogen fixers to your land changed your lives as much as it has ours? And what about some of the options that we missed? Let us know in the comments below. You know how much we enjoy hearing from our listeners. See you next week. Cheers.